Good morning and welcome to the COP Trust to continue the discussion on agricultural advantage, the case for climate action in agriculture. We want to thank all the sponsors, there are very many, who have facilitated the series of discussions that have been taking place for the last week here and will be continued today and tomorrow. I particularly want to welcome you all for coming this morning. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to welcome you to a session that says the breeding advantage. And within that session, we want to discuss in particular tapping into genetic diversity for food security in a four degrees world. Now that's kind of a little shocking statement because didn't we all agree two degrees world. I want to start saying just a few words, personal words. Earlier this year in May, I was traveling from a research station Mersout, in Morocco with a friend and colleague who is also a renowned scientist. We had just visited a hundred hectares and saw what was growing and we told this all was doing quite well with less than 300 millimeters of rain. As we were driving towards Rabat, I learned that only 10 years ago, that region had predictable rain of about 600 to 700 millimeters a year, rarely an exception. I was both shocked and encouraged. Shocked because 10 years isn't that long. And see your rainfall decline your heat index rising and the rainfall become much less reliable is an enormous challenge. Encouraged because we saw fields that at least on a research station did very well. So there is hope and there is an enormous amount of rethinking because what we have to do now, if we talk about the breeding advantage and tapping into a four degree world, then we have to really anticipate what could happen in the next 10 years. There's a lot of information out there, but I think the challenge ahead of us is still to find out how we respond to these challenges in terms of breeding. Can we continue to do incremental breeding as we might have been doing over the last 20, 30 years? Or is there a big systemic shift that is needed. So I'm very happy and pleased and honored to introduce a distinguished panel for our discussion today. Because, of course, we have high expectations that we want to see what they have to suggest to see what we might be doing in the next 10 to 15 years. Our first speaker will be Charlotte Lusty, who works at the Cork Trust and has spent her career and biodiversity and conservation of genetic material. She oversees the CGR gene banks and leads the program that is funded for that purpose. Our second speaker, speaker will be Andy Jervis. He spends his life to protect ecosystem services, which is probably going to be one of our greatest challenge as we try to adapt to the four degree world. Every drop of water counts. Every bit of soil matters. Our third speaker will be Thomas Meyer, who is a senior advisor at the Ministry of Food, Agriculture and Consumer Protection at the German, the German Ministry. And he will tell us a little bit about the international treaty and perhaps a bit about the complex system of intellectual property rights. And finally, the conclusion will get a policy angle by Ali Abu Saba, who is the Director General of ICADA and comes, brings to it a long background in development work project and policy with the African Development Bank, very familiar with the territory where most of us work. Thank you very much, and I won't say more, and I would like to have, oh, sorry, no, no, I have forgotten to mention our dear moderator, Mr. Luigi Guerino. 
He is leading the science team at the Crop Trust, and I think he is a very old hand, and everything genetic. Thank you, Luigi. I'm sorry. Charlotte, the word is yours. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've actually just uh, stepped off a, a plane from Fiji, so I'm in the bizarre situation of finding Fiji is already here in Bonn. <laughs> and I, I actually wear my, my Fijian flower, which is uh, the way people... Uh, Male, female of all ages all have this behind their ear looking very elegant, but uh, I'm just wearing it here for now. I don't feel too elegant today. Right, so I'm going to talk to you about gene banks and their role in climate change. And as Margaret was telling us, agriculture must transform over the next 30 years in order for us to avoid mass famine, basically. 60% increased production is needed to keep up with the increase in world population figures. If uh, that production is to happen, there must also be an adaptation of our crops to the ab abiotic stresses that they're experiencing and the uh, increasing uh, incidence and spread of pests and diseases, amongst other things. And as well as all of that, Agriculture has a responsibility to reduce the emissions that they're producing. Current levels of 19% estimated or more of total greenhouse gases coming from uh, agriculture must come down. To make this transformation happen, plant genetic resources very much underpin uh, the possibilities that there are for, for changing agriculture and they affect every aspect of agricultural systems from the state of soil and the management of water to uh, the state of ecosystems, the ability to deal with pests and diseases and their resilience and, and to increase yield. So plant genetic resources are behind them all. Whether at a system level, whether we're talking about diverse agricultural systems or whether we're talking about diverse species within those systems, or whether we're talking about diversity within the species, so diversity of varieties, all of these layers of diversity of plant genetic resources are very important to our future existence. And coming back from Fiji, one of the crops we were talking about there and is very important to those populations existing over a vast geographical area there in the Pacific is a crop like coconut. Uh, very important to them, very resilient in the face of cyclones and climate change and rising sea le levels, producing an important level of, of protection to the coastlines and to the ecosystems and bringing income to uh, very um, poor, marginalized smallholder farmers. So here is a key crop where, uh, that plays a role, a very important role in the future of, of our agriculture. And, and perhaps more uh, familiar is, is the story of breeding and how we're able to uh, build new, improved varieties that have traits that can deal with climate change. This is a key source of hope for the future. And one of the important sources of those traits come from crop wild relatives. In fact, a great deal of work has already been done to integrate the traits that we find in the, the wild species that are related to crops, conveying a, a large number of uh, different and important uh, traits to improve varieties, particularly where um, wild relatives in centers of diversity have had a long experience of battling well-known pests and pathogens within those centers of diversity and can now convey those traits into improved varieties. And this is where we come to gene banks because it is in gene banks that we are able to conserve and uh, research and develop better understanding of these plant genetic resources. And right now, as I'm standing here now, I can say we don't really know the full value of what we are conserving in those gene banks. But equally, we don't know the extent of the challenges we will face. What we do know is that gene banks provide us options. 
many options for how we move forward. And equally as important as the actual facilities, the physical seeds in the gene banks, is the system within which we're working. No one country is self-sufficient in genetic resources. It depends completely on a layer of collaboration across continents and across countries. And this exists in the International Ple uh, Plant Treaty. We will hear more from Thomas Meyer about that in a multilateral system of access and benefit sharing. It exists in international gene banks that are able to reach very high standards of operation and ensure that materials are held in the long term. It also exists equally in the same centers being able to uh, put in place very high levels of phytosanitary control so that we do not spread pests and diseases. And equally in the information systems that are shared across countries so that we know what are in these gene banks. So we're very much dependent on there being a global system of collaboration and coordination here. And what I want to tell you specifically about is the gene bank platform that is uh, developed within the CGIR uh, in the 11 centers that have a responsibility to manage these resources for the international community. And these are located in various uh, developing countries, mostly in the centers of crop diversity of the crops that they care and manage for. And in this gene bank platform, we are targeting, uh, targeting uh, uh, target 2.5 of the sustainable development goals, clearly uh, with an aim to maintain the genetic diversity and increase the levels of genetic diversity of seeds and cultivated plants held in those gene banks, and importantly, uh, promoting their use and uh, promoting access and fair and equi equitable sharing of the benefits arising from those genetic resources. And a core part of our work is very, well, you could almost call it routine. It's very much um, putting in place the kinds of operations that will ensure that none of these seeds lose viability or are lost from the collections. Many of them date back many decades, collected from farmers' fields back in the 60s and the 70s. And these are, in, in many cases, these gene banks that are the only places you can still find these seeds. So there is a, a large amount of work uh, involved in, sh in ensuring that they are safe and healthy and free of pests and diseases and available uh, for distribution. And indeed, the CG centers are um, busily providing uh, genetic resources upon request, uh, dealing with more than 2,000 requests every year distributing more than 100,000 samples annually to more than 100 countries worldwide. Um, and their numbers of accessions in these gene banks, as you see here, around 750,000 accessions, mostly in the form of seed, but also in the form of tissue culture for certain roots and tubers and bananas that do not have seeds that are held viably in storage, and uh, a, a large collection of uh, plants and trees that are held in the field. These collections are becoming more and more used and more and more relevant. They have uh, increased uh, distribution levels by something like twofold over the last decade. And, and we can expect that increase to continue as we get to know the genes and uh, their expression and the traits that they convey within these materials. And there is a vastly improved capability to use these traits and integrate them into improved varieties. Um, and I have to emphasize also, this is a picture from um, Lebanon, from the Akada Gene Bank. And as uh, Margaret was saying, they have managed to uh, do a tremendous job of um, gathering not only the materials from the region and looking after them, but in the face of the disaster that they, uh, um, that they faced in Syria, they were able to uh, rescue their collection. It was all conserved in this Folbard seed vault. And they have returned to Lebanon and Morocco and replanted out their, in, their collections and put them back in storage. So there is a, a level of security within this global system that is really almost infallible. 
And I think, uh, as Margaret was saying, they managed to plant these, these, um, these seeds out in, in difficult conditions where there had been less rain, very much less rain than normal, and still these seeds are viable, and, and this is very much our genetic heritage from a, a long, long time ago, being in very safe hands in Ikada. Similarly, uh, we have a situation here in SIP where the communities uh, around and about had actually discovered that they'd lost quite a number of their potato varieties that they remembered vaguely from um, childhood. And the gene bank there, the CGIR gene bank, the International Potato Center based in Lima, were able to dig into their collection and find those varieties and repatriate them to the communities. So we have very real examples of how these gene banks show their security, show their availability of resources, and are acting very much in the way and uh, means that we, we hope to see them carry on. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, Charlotte. That, that was a great segue into what I'm going to talk about. So I'm Andy Jarvis. I, I work for the CCAFS program um, on issues around climate smart agriculture and the kind of practices and technologies that are needed to adapt to the climate challenges. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of the, the transition from what are these genetic resources, what's their relevance then in the climate problem and, um, uh, and what, what uh, different initiatives are doing in terms of the breeding side of things. So I don't have a nice flower, I'm afraid. I, I, I didn't get that memo to do that. So, uh, oh, here we go, a lovely flower. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead with that. <laughs> OK, so, so first of all, just why breeding? What are we, what are we thinking about here? Um, so so uh, the first reason that, that has kind of been, this has been an issue for, for several decades now of kind of crop improvement is just to feed a growing population. We have two things changing. One is a, a growing population, and second is changing consumption patterns. So we do need to be producing more food into the future. And all of that within a context of climate change. And so this is IPCC data and, and it's showing pretty much any crop that you look at you see moving forwards to 2050 um, uh, a, a trend with increases in temperature of reduced yields and so climate generally is many crops are at their, their limits in terms of um, uh, uh, temperatures right now when temperatures especially go above 30 degrees you see this drop off of yield and so that is uh, uh, happening uh, for a number of crops, and especially in, in tropical regions where you're already at these high temperatures. So you're seeing here uh, in wheat and maize pretty significant uh, reductions with a four degree world um, as in the context of this discussion. So big challenges going forward. We've done analysis of kind of asking the question, well, when do these impacts start happening? It's gradual, but are there kind of, is it nonlinear? Are there thresholds where we suddenly see major drop-offs. And so the question we started with is, well, when are these impacts going to really be felt? Um, and so we went across a whole bunch of staple crops of Africa, for example, here looking at, uh, uh, at the date at which you see these crops becoming non-viable um, in these regions. So, so take, take an area in, in, in Africa, and what we were asking is, well, if, if they're growing right now yams, for example, in what year or what decade is yam no longer going to be suitable? And you see different cases for different crops, and it's kind of visualized here. You can see some crops pretty resistant. Um, many roots and tubers are uh, resistant to climate as, as, it, as it advances. They, they have kind of built-in resistance to high temperatures, drought issues. Other crops much more sensitive. And so um, especially coming out from this has been uh, the issue of kind of me maize and beans coming out as, as, as priority crops for action, where impacts are starting to happen, not kind of later in the century, but actually within the next couple of decades, you can see large areas transforming. So you, just to look at it in detail on beans, you can see many areas here, the areas in red, are areas where we're seeing uh, loss of cropping area. So it, these are areas where it'll become unviable to grow beans um, into the future. Um, and so some of those, uh, those impacts are happening, not, not kind of 
50 years down the line, but 20 years down the line. And so we're, we're, we're approaching kind of these, the, uh, the point where these, these regions have to transform in their cropping systems, unless we um, uh, take some serious action in terms of adaptation. Likewise for maize, there are certain areas, very important uh, cropping areas in, uh, for maize in, uh, across uh, um, Africa where also we're seeing the, uh, going over those tipping points. So, so this is the context we're working, pretty, pretty uh, uh, negative impacts, pretty uh, alarming um, statistics in terms of uh, impacts over the next, uh, in the short term, 20 years, uh, as well as in the, in the, the kind of through the century. So, this is this uh, this seminar is a little bit about kind of looking at the breeding advantage. So the you know what what can crop breeding do within this kind of climate adaptation sphere? And so can we breed ourselves out of the problem? And so there's been a number of people have kind of looked at this in terms of can we can we face can we increase for example production to be able to um, feed the growing population? And this is without necessarily taking into a, uh, account climate change. The current trajectory of, of yield increases that we've enjoyed over the last uh, uh, 40 years since the Green Revolution is, is kind of steadily been going up, but still if you kind of extrapolate out at current levels, it's just not going to get us to where we need to be. Um, and so we do need to kind of um, uh, look at new ways of, of increasing this, what they call genetic gain. So yield increases significantly going up. Now one of the challenges is that breeding's not like uh, something where we're going we're gonna to produce a new variety, a crop, and we'll release it next year. That's not the way it works. This is long lead times. So um, the average kind of crop breeding uh, process um, can take, this is an example for exa in, in bananas, of, of taking 17 years to, to, to even getting close to kind of a, a, a distribution of, of new materials. And so, you know, we're talking multi-decade investments. And so you need to start now if you're going to breed for um, uh, technologies that are going to help, um, uh, for example, Africa in the next 20, in, in 20 years' time. So you need to be starting now. So it's, it's a long, long process. So the, the kind of the way a lot of, a lot of uh, um, centers, research centers have been going about this is kind of what, first of all looking at well what are, the, what are the challenges out there? What are the types of abiotic traits? What are the, the climate challenges that are going to face a crop? And so this is an, an example in beans across Africa. Um, and so there we ask the question, well, what is, what is the, the, the climate factor that will most hold back productivity in beans in this uh, in the next 20 years and so here you can see areas uh, it's it's a mixed bag it's not always just heat and drought but in the case of, of beans you have large areas with with heat uh, issues heat challenges large areas with uh, drought uh, things but also excess water water logging and things like that that can actually spur on all sorts of pest and disease issues. So first of all, it's the priority setting of what do we need to breed for. It's setting up the infrastructure to be able to test and breed for that. So, so this is, for example, this is a, a greenhouse in, in, in Seattle, in Colombia, where we, look, we, we can raise temperatures by 2 degrees, 3 degrees, and 4 degrees within the greenhouse, and then evaluate materials under a kind of future climate. So, so uh, it's a means of, of kind of simulating the future. Um, and so then we go to the genetic resources that, that Charlotte has, has, uh, has spoken about and look for traits and look for the kinds of uh, uh, characteristics that are going to be desirable in a, um, uh, into the future. So this is, this is then kind of just an example of, of uh, this is again sticking with the bean example. Uh, you have the primary kind of gene pool, which is the with Fasciolus vulgaris, that's the, the crop, the species that is, is cropped a um, common bean across the world. And that really comes from a subhumid to dry kind of uh, ecosystem. But then it, uh, within, so within that crop gene pool, you have a, a range of conditions where you might find materials. But also you have kind of wild relatives. And, and so you have a secondary gene pool, which is, there's a number of species there that are generally come from the humid and subhumid uh, areas. And often you find there uh, characteristics with pest disease resistance, uh, vigorous rooting that can be useful um, um, uh, also as a, as a, as a drought uh, adaptation 
uh, option. And then you can go into the tertiary gene pool where you'll, you'll see these other species that, uh, where we're identifying a lot of the heat and the drought um, resistance. So you go looking for these characteristics and integrating them into, into your, um, um, your crop. So uh, just a few examples of some of the success stories. One is the, uh, the El Nino bean. We call it the El Nino bean. This was, uh, this, uh, you're not just kind of breeding for a kind of future average climate of increased temperature, but also looking at climate variability. So El Nino hits uh, many parts of the world. In Colombia, it hits, uh, uh, El Nino means drought um, and heat. And so we did a whole process kind of selecting from these materials and identified a bean that during an El Nino uh, event is going to be much more adapted to, to conditions. And so this was really just selection, but it was pu pulled from one of the species that are in, is in that gene, tertiary gene pool, a cross with, with one of those species. Um, drought tolerant maize, and so this has been a, a, a kind of for CIMIT, a kind of flagship project uh, program over the last uh, 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 10, uh, 15 years. And so uh, they're having uh, already massive impacts across Africa in terms of adoption of drought tolerant maize. And this is really kind of pushing the boundary of what maize can tolerate. And also they've been looking now moving into heat tolerant maize as well. And so the, this combination of these is, is, uh, is, 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 has great potential into the future for, for adaptation. Another important aspect of all of this is the, the participatory plant breeding side of things. So one thing is kind of in the lab, the, 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 the kind of development of these technologies in, in, in research centers, but also getting out and looking at far, bringing farmers' preferences into this process. And so um, this is a, a, there's an example here from, from beans in Africa where it's generally a woman's crop and you're looking at uh, uh, varietal testing and selection based on some of the traits that, that farmers themselves are looking for. And you see men value traits like yield and market value, whereas uh, women are also looking at things like short cooking time. So you have to bring all of this into these aspects of uh, farmer preferences into um, the, um, the process. And so um, the final point I'll just make is, is uh, Charlotte mentioned kind of crop wild relatives and their importance. This is some, some work actually that we did from, from uh, over, over 20 years ago almost. Um, but this was using, th th as, as we get looking for these different traits, you go further and further away from the crops themselves, looking at their wild relatives for, for these traits. And this is an example of in, in peanuts um, where there was a new variety developed. And it was really the crossing of three wild relatives um, uh, into, into the crop gene pool. And, and, and actually, one of the, the challenges of this is the, the wild relatives themselves are not well collected, and they're also threatened themselves by climate change. And so of those three wild relatives, there's actually one of those is kind of confirmed extinct, extinct in the wild. And so this is also a big challenge, is getting those wild relatives into gene banks. So just to segue into the next pr presentation, I mean, the, the, the need for materials, the thirst for these kinds of materials to, for crop adaptation is, is pretty high. And so you've got kind of crops coming from all over the world. And as Charlotte mentioned, this, this uh, interdependent world um, where um, you know, we've got a globalized kind of food system, cropping systems. And so we need, we need an enabling environment on the policy side of things for these materials to be available and, uh, um, and usable in breeding programs. So at that, I'll, I'll, I'll end and hand over to Thomas. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Thomas Meyer. I'm from the German Ministry of uh, Food and Agriculture. Um, and I thank you very much for that uh, bridge, in fact, because that's um, where I would start my presentation from, this uh, hopefully enabling environment for exchange of genetic resources. Here we go. Um, I think I don't have to repeat, you're all familiar with, with these uh, basic facts that uh, PGRFA, Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, um, are key for um, our future food security. Um, we have a long history of this uh, interregional and even international exchange of these um, resources. And um, as just has been shown by these, uh, on these slides, um, there's this high interdependence between uh, countries nowadays. So just an example of, of coffee, how it traveled around the world in, in, in um, different times and was bred here and brought somewhere else and developed further on. 
So that's where we are today. We have all this interconnection um, globally, more or less. That was, of course, um, realized, recognized uh, some time ago, uh, some time ago already, and it was again confirmed in um, Sustainable Development Goal Two. We already saw in, in your slide. Um, saying that um, by 2020 um, we have to maintain genetic diversity of seeds, cultivated plants, and so on. Um, so when I said it was um, recognized some time ago, it was uh, already even before, but I think one of the major steps was 72 in, in a UN conference when they said we have to build up an international program to preserve um, world's genetic resources. And in 1983, the Commission uh, on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture was uh, established, one of the key bodies, I would say, globally to coordinate this work. And maybe, I guess most of you here will know these products from the Commission, which are the Global Plans of Actions for Plant, Animal, um, Forestry, Fish, um, which lay out, in fact, the basic um, agenda for our work in this, in this field. Now, Back that time, um, when the Commission was founded, for example, 83, um, we had this concept of genetic resources being a, a common heritage. So it was, um, as I said, it was exchanged throughout the world, so it was everybody's um, more or less heritage. And exchange should be as free as possible to further boost the breeding and to um, really make use of these fantastic possibilities we just heard about breeding. Um, but then somehow the concept shifted because people re realized that if we want to conserve something, you have to give it a value. So they, th they thought, okay, if a country has rights over these resources, it may feel more responsibility or more use of really conserving that because then it has your value and you can use it uh, um, later on more as, a, as, a, as, a, as a market product. Um, and that was when, in the con when the, um, this idea is then enshrined in the Convention on Biological Diversity, 93, when they um, said, okay, states have sovereign rights over their resources. Now, that is a bit of, uh, of a shift now. Um, and um, in that conference, they already uh, agreed that this is not uh, something you could uh, really um, based on if you're working in agriculture and with genetic resources for food and agriculture. So therefore they tasked, in fact, FAO to negotiate an instrument um, which, which um, helps to keep this free exchange of, uh, of material. And that was then eventually in 2001 adopted the International Treaty on uh, Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, ITP GRFA. Um, in that was uh, agreed 2001, and in 2007, a basic instrument, this multilateral system we heard about before as well, um, was established by the creation of a, a standard material transfer agreement, which I will um, come to in a minute. Um, nowadays, we have about 143 contracting parties. That's uh, quite a lot. Um, and recently, the United States of America joined, so one of the big players in genetic resources as well. I have to check. No, this one. This one. Yeah. Um, Time-wise, the Nagoya Protocol was much later. That is, the, in fact, the um, instrument which was created under the CBD um, to have this bilateral exchange. The treaty was much earlier, as I said, 2001. Nevertheless, I compared these two just to, to show you the difference between those two approaches. Under the CBD, the Nagoya Protocol, you have this bilateral approach where every user has to negotiate bilaterally with um, the providing country terms and conditions of access and of exchange. And this is, of course, quite, um, quite a challenge maybe, and therefore this multilateral system where you have standardized terms of exchange uh, is the one which we prefer for the agriculture. That is as well recognized under the uh, Nagoya Protocol, especially pointing at the special um, characteristics of these um, genetic resources. Now, what's the scope of the treaty? It is um, all plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. That's quite a lot. Includes crop wild relatives. Not always clear boundaries, but that's how it's uh, stated in the treaty. Um, and that's where we are. Then, within that system, um, comprising all plant genetic resources, 
um, we have created this multilateral system of access and benefit sharing um, that says, okay, sovereign countries have their sovereign rights, but in that sovereignty, they agree to build up this multilateral system where they give all their, let's say, agree on certain conditions to have this um, access to PGRFA and to share benefits. Um, it consists of 64 crops. They are much more PGRFA, but 64 is um, the major content, which are about 80% of uh, our food from, from plants. Now, this multilateral system then is supposed to create something like a, like a virtual... Oh, I see there's some German on this slide. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> but the uh, basic idea is you have this multilateral system um, which creates uh, this virtual uh, gene bank where all the 64 crops are in and the accessions of contracting parties which are under their management and control. Um, this is a um, um, practical um, example. This is our, our German uh, website where you can um, go through search. Um, so this is our contribution to that MLS. If you look for German material, you will find it um, here. And I guess there's an English version for that website as well. No, what's the outcome? It's um, about 1.7 million accessions are documented in that system. Um, we saw some numbers before. These are a bit different, but more or less the same uh, magnitude. Um, about 47,000 uh, standard material transfer agreements have been um, used since 2007, and that's up to uh, between six and 800 transfers of genetic material per day. Here you can see statistics it's from January last year, but these are the general numbers where these material um, went to, to which countries, to which regions, in fact, FAO regions. Now, I was mostly uh, speaking uh, until now about um, this um, exchange uh, of material, um, but of course there is this um, conservation sustainable use aspect as well that is more or less um, guaranteed through this ex exchange because exchange means use. Um, but there's as well the um, uh, component of benefit sharing. Um, basic idea is given here on this rather complicated slide, but um, I would only focus on is there some the pointer? Yep, here. So this is the material where you are working with if, if you are still in the breeding process. And once something gets um, out of that and gets on the market, um, the company, whoever, um, has to pay um, a small amount of its, of its sales to something which is called benefit sharing fund. And from that multilateral fund, the money will go um, to different um, uses. It is, of course, not only um, the money, which is the benefit sharing, it is also all kinds of um, other possibilities like exchange of information, um, technology transfer, capacity building, um, yeah, these kind, which are in the CBD as, as well mentioned. Um, this sharing of um, um, commercial um, income so far has been rather limited, um, close to zero, in fact zero. Um, what has been flown into the benefit sharing fund are voluntary contributions from contracting parties, which are um, about 20 million US dollars since 2010, I think. Um, how this money is used is given some examples uh, on this slide um, for all kinds of projects, setting up, setting up regional um, um, plants, giving into farmers' fields. Um, community seed banks and all this stuff, breeding programs as well. So quite a lot has been done and quite a lot of farmers have been reached, but uh, you can always say it could be more benefit sharing. Um, could be more, so what are the next steps in this whole, um, uh, in, in the treaty context? Um, as I said, tw oops, sorry, I'll come back. This one said 20 million of voluntary contributions so far, but no um, comp contributions from uh, from uh, commercial um, income. Um, so therefore, the governing body, the treaty, decided to set up a process where um, whereby this benefit sharing mechanism can be um, can be improved to get a better system to get um, income from uh, breeders to the benefit sharing system. 
And on the other hand, to expand the MLS, it is 64 crops, I said, 80% of food, but um, some major crops like soybean, for example, are still missing. Some underutilized crops are missing. So now it's a, it's a two-sided process, once increasing the benefit sharing, and on the other hand, um, in expanding uh, the coverage, the crop coverage of the treaty. And I think with that, it's all from my side. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I think uh, I have the privilege of building on the past few presentations who have uh, actually laid the ground uh, very nicely for what I intend to speak uh, to you about uh, today. Uh, my name is Abu Saba, uh, Ali Abu Saba. I'm the Director General of ICARDA, and I'm on the job for almost a few days, uh, one year and a few days, just a few days. And when I look at the title of the presentation, I remember my first conversation with the Deputy Director General of Research, a uh, very capable individual, Dr. Andrew Noble, uh, during the first couple of weeks of our conversation when I started to speak about my vision for organization and how we want to reorient our work uh, around this four degree uh, world, uh, having had uh, an opportunity to work on climate extensively with my previous position just before moving into ICARDA. And I found uh, great interest, great enthusiasm, and the same thing with many of our scientists, because they are actually living the situation of a region that is moving very quickly into a four-degree world. So, uh, ICARDA has uh, put in place uh, a strategy that is going to uh, guide our work for the ten, next 10 years. Uh, that would basically try to uh, uh, reorient our research programs around this uh, 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 very quickly approaching uh, climate scenario. And that will build very strongly on the achievement of the organization over the past 40 years. And we will not focus only on the crop improvement dimension, but rather we will focus on greater integration among the work that we do in ECARDA, focusing on the uh, uh, crop improvement, but also the water agenda the livestock and small ruminants, and greater integration among the different programs so that you're able to bring in uh, resilience. Now, uh, there is a World Bank report uh, that uh, uh, predicts uh, a chance, 40% chance of uh, uh, exceeding uh, a four degree uh, warm, warmer uh, world by the end of the century, even a 10% chance of exceeding even a five uh, degree uh, by the end of the century. Uh, in the region where we, ICARDA is, is operating, we are seeing evidence of that. Uh, in Kuwait, uh, in 2010, registered uh, the highest uh, uh, temperatures recorded in history, uh, 553.7 uh, degrees, and you can imagine uh, how hot that environment is, but also uh, to be followed by the next highest recorded uh, temperature, uh, 53.7. Uh, and uh, that has uh, uh, serious implications um, in the region as a whole, both in terms of variation uh, of rainfall, uh, uh, more, more unpredictable weather pattern patterns, and even the growing seasons uh, are uh, shifting. So uh, uh, with these uh, kind of things and bearing in mind the increased uh, uh, projected population by at least uh, doubling by the year 2050, uh, it basically shows you the complexity of the problem that in the region uh, where uh, we work. Now, uh, this map attempts to show uh, the uh, implication of this uh, uh, potentially uh, uh, hotter uh, climate in the region where we serve, and the greatest impact uh, clearly shows and is visible in the area of mean precipitation, but also uh, temperatures. Now, uh, uh, for a four-degree uh, uh, region, warmer region, 
uh, ICARDA uh, works with uh, partner centers from within the CGIR, uh, but also very strongly and very closely with the national uh, research partners in the regions uh, where we're active. And the thrust of our work is basically to try and help uh, 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 advanced research on crop improvement to produce high value and climate resilient crops, uh, crop improvements uh, for yield potential, but also for biotic and abiotic stresses, uh, greater integration between the uh, uh, livestock, the rangelands, the crops and the production systems. That by itself increases the ability, the resilience of the people living in those regions to be able to withstand and sustain those uh, negative impacts of the climate intensification and diversification of cropping systems, of course protected agriculture especially within the Gulf areas and, uh, and West Asia, uh, under a more constrained water uh, environment, uh, some instances and where uh, it's uh, in some instances it will become probably the only uh, way for those uh, people to be able to produce crops. Improvement in water availability and management including recycling of water and of course value addition uh, on dairy uh, product. It is important uh, uh, to know uh, that at some point in time uh, agriculture will not even be an option. So it is equally important as we look into the limits of how far we can stretch those things is for us to also look at alternative livelihoods so that uh, the uh, ultimate idea is to help those populations. Now. Um, You've heard a lot about the gene banks, and ICARDA has one of those very active uh, gene banks where we have uh, significant collections from those four uh, key uh, non-tropical uh, dry land uh, agrobiodiversity uh, uh, sources or centers, uh, 155,000 uh, accessions in the key uh, commodities where ICARDA has the global mandate, barley, wheat, chickpea, uh, fava bean, lentil, and you know, a few others. Of course, uh, one uh, very important uh, uh, value of the collections we have is the uh, wild relatives uh, that uh, is uh, uh, heavily used in uh, the crop improvement programs. In uh, uh, making the selections, uh, we have developed what uh, is known to be the focused identification of Sherman plasma strategy. And it's a technique to uh, really uh, look at the linkages between the environment and the traits you're seeking into the kind of crop you want to breed for. And through the application of this technique, you're able to do a much more focused selection of the kind of genetic resource you would use uh, in your own uh, breeding programs. Uh, our pre-breeding work largely uh, occurs in Morocco and Lebanon, where uh, 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 we draw heavily on the wealth of genetic resource that is available uh, to us. Now, one of the things that is new that we are de doing in the new strategy is uh, promotion of this, the, the research programs on the farming with alternative pollinators. Uh, this has uh, a, a potential to significantly improve income. And ICARDA, by the way, is the only CG center that is currently working on this uh, pollinator uh, protection. Uh, one program that shows uh, the collaborative uh, efforts that we do across with other CGIR centers is the collaboration uh, program with CIMIT around the One Global Wheat program, where we have the opportunity to, uh, 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 we use a field uh, testing genotyping to be able to uh, work in uh, many of the regions. And I think so far uh, we have very, very encouraging results uh, in the initial uh, uh, year of the program uh, so far. Uh, we are also using um, our presence and our partnership within the region to uh, disseminate and increase the uptake of uh, technologies that are being produced. We are active in 12 countries in Africa where uh, the work that we have done on heat uh, prone and, and disease prone uh, variety uh, ecologies uh, uh, has enabled a significant amount of, uh, for instance, wheat production in countries that are not known traditionally in uh, growing wheat, such as Nigeria uh, and uh, Sudan. Under these very, very hot environments, it has been possible with the support uh, and the research outcomes of the work we do in ICARDA. In uh, Southwest uh, Asia, uh, we are working on uh, developing new varieties of lentil 
that is uh, uh, possible to do uh, uh, to, to harvest mechanically, and this is uh, increasingly becoming very useful, uh, especially within the context of using the small window of opportunity with rice fallows, where almost 15 million hectares of land are left fallow, uh, uh, and ICARDA uh, work in the in the promote in the development of these niche, these new varieties is making it possible for farmers to actually uh, exploit that. Barley is again one key uh, 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 crop that ICARDA believes strongly will be the future uh, climate in the, uh, clim uh, will be the future crop in the region under uh, increasingly uh, hotter uh, climates. And uh, you will see from this um, slide that trends uh, in uh, uh, the work that we do in uh, barley has been decreasing. And uh, because of its, the huge potential, the potential that this uh, offers, both in terms of uh, uh, um, human uh, food, but also animal feed, as well as the industrial uh, applications, uh, we believe uh, we're going to be scaling out our work in, in Bali. And of course, uh, funding of this work continues to be uh, a problem. I think overall, you could see that uh, the region uh, is facing real threats uh, uh, under an increasingly warming climate. Uh, ICARDA is already preparing for this future uh, in a, a, a multi-sectoral approach by greater integration of the research programs we do. Uh, ICARDA cannot provide all the solutions alone. ICARDA has to work with other CGIR centers to bring in uh, knowledge and expertise from across the world to complement and augment the capacity and, uh, and the ability of us to provide solutions to their national research partners, which is really a unique model through which, operates, through which uh, ICARDA operates. Uh, we also need to look beyond the possibility of agriculture being the main source of livelihood by looking at alternative sources of livelihoods. So in this uh, area, our collaboration with organizations such as IFPRI and, and, and many of the others national partners becomes a, a very critical and very important partnership. So thank you very much. Thank you. Can I ask all the um, speakers to come up to the front, please? And so we have about half an hour or so for questions and answers from uh, both the um, audience here, the live audience, and also from the um, uh, online audience. So I hope you've got lots of questions for all our panelists. So we're all set. So while waiting for the um, audience from the uh, audience and um, uh, questions from the audience, both online and live, maybe I can start off by uh, asking Andy um, one question that occurred to me while listening to your talk. You talked about um, showing areas in Africa where beans and maize uh, will become unviable. Um, but how do you make the link back to the gene bank? How do, you, how do you find material that could help you to solve those problems uh, amongst the 750,000 or accessions in the CG centers or 7.2 million worldwide? How do you make that link? OK. I mean, the, the first thing is that I mean, the gene banks have thousands and thousands of, of collections there. And, and, and as, as Charlotte kind of said, there's it, it provides options, right? Um, you know, in the last 20 years, heat and drought tolerance has kind of become a key variable you're looking for. But in most cases, these the, the gene banks could, you know, have thousands of these uh, these collections that haven't actually been screened for it. So the first thing is screening for these kinds of these kinds of traits. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I showed the example of the bean one. It was almost by accident that they spotted. In that case, it was actually a wild relative going even further beyond. The, the, the collection into the wild relatives of beans that they, they, they found the kind of origins of, uh, of, of heat tolerance in, in beans. So it was going to a wild relative. And so it's, it's really, I mean, it, it, 
it's a question right now of it, this is why it takes a long time because you, it's not not that easy to find the traits and make the crosses and get them into cultivars that farmers like and will adopt and grow. Um, so it's it is a long process, but it starts by the screening uh, across the across the gene bank and, and crop wild relatives are becoming a lot more a lot more important for that because we've 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 mined a lot of the kind of opportunities from 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 the, the crop gene pools. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, we had a question here. Uh, to the same uh, uh, presentation, you showed a slide on uh, participatory plant breeding, but then within the slide you talked about that the farmers help you in participatory variety selection. Is it the one or the other? Both. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, I think it's very important uh, if you're going to achieve it, adoption and under the multiple uh, kind of factors that a farmer is choosing to, to or, or looking for, the traits that a farmer is looking for to, to, to grow a crop, then it's very important that they're involved in the process of selection. And so I think you know, that can increase, increase your adoption. I mean, I think we, we, we wrote a, a paper a little bit about what are the what potential is there from crop improvement to address climate? And, and one of the things that, one of the conclusions was that you can't throw any approach out the window from you know, the biotechnology in the lab through to the kind of very participatory uh, work down on the ground with the, with the farmers. It, 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 it's all needed, actually, to, to, to address the huge challenge. Um, and right now, we're not staying up, we're not keeping up with climate, with crop, crop improvement. So we do need to throw new, through new approaches at it. The question was more related to because Microphone. everybody, everybody is doing a participatory variety selection, even even the multinationals. But uh, <coughs> um, so the question: To what degree to involve the farmers in the breeding process? So is it really participatory uh, plant breeding, which means that uh, even in segregating populations, the farmers help to select, or is it really to uh, work in the more finished products and do they? Variety selection to see whether they have farmer farmer acceptance. I still stick. I mean, it's, it, it it depends, and it's and it's kind of both of those things. Um, you know, I, I I think you need need a cross through the breeding spe spectrum, and it depends on the crop as well. I mean, I it, it's been participatory uh, varietal selection in, in in beans, for example, in Africa has been hugely successful as an approach. Um, in other crops, it might be more difficult. It's, it it really depends on the system. Well, I guess the bottom line is uh, don't throw anything out the window. I mean, um, any any approach um, has its value in, a pro in the appropriate context. You had a, you had a question here. Yes, um, one question is to anybody on the panel. We talked a lot about yields and crop improvement. What yields at what price? What other resources have to go into estimating the yield increase and perhaps shifting from maximum to optimal? Which leads me to my second question. If no more beans in the many African countries that you have shown, what comes next? And what do we have to look for now in our gene banks in order to initiate the search for the next? And the third question would be, how helpful is the treaty in all of this, the exchange of material? OK. Let's take one question at a time. Maybe the first one is directed maybe at you, Ali. Maybe yes. you can say well, something. I think uh, it's important to recognize from a research perspective, the focus is on maximizing productivity out of water. Now, from a policy decision and implementation, each country makes their own decision. We have seen very uh, 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 you know, clear examples in Saudi Arabia when they wanted to grow wheat and wanted to become self-sufficient and great investments in water and and, and center pivots, that was not at all maximization of, you know, uh, uh, you, uh, the maximization of production for, for the kind of water that they were extracting, which brought in long-term negative impact in terms of the, you know, drop in, in water levels. Uh, so I think this is a question of, uh, you know, policy at country level. They will, our, uh, the, the, the value of research is that we provide the options, we provide the evidence, and then hopefully through advocacy we're able to influence some of those uh, decisions. Related uh, uh, to this, maybe the very first point about selection, allow me just to come back uh, with a very interesting story on this. I was visiting Kuwait a couple of months ago, and I was looking at some of the new work that they're doing on palm dates and the tissue culture, and they told me that after the Iraq-Kuwaiti uh, war, after all 
some of those palm trees continued to be standing and producing. So there was a natural selection. You go there and you collect those, and then that's an opportunity for you really to look into what are the very unique traits that something like this offers. And I think there are many examples. I mean, in science, some of those things do happen and provide excellent opportunity uh, for, for the scientists to, to, to build on. I hope I covered at least the first couple of things. Yes, and maybe this on the second one, on what happens after after beans, or uh, maybe, Charlotte, you can say something? Yeah. Well, I mean, there are other options, and um, you have other crops, obviously, that can deal with the um, kinds of temperatures that beans can't deal with, cowpea, for instance. So uh, as you move into, as, uh, as environments change other crops from other environments that were previously uh, warmer, they're able to... Uh, learn lessons um, from, 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 from the different uh, and changing environments. So there, there are lots and lots of options, and as long as we um, get to understand better how um, crops uh, behave in, in different temperatures, different growing seasons, uh, different challenges, the, the more we can use the, the different options that we have available. And a follow-up question might be, how do you know well, what, those, what those options are? And for that, I would I would point you to the to the Genesis uh, system, which brings together information on uh, genetic resources collections uh, around the world, and is part of the treaty's global information system. And speaking of the treaty, there was a question there also uh, to Thomas: To what extent is the treaty really helping all this? Um, I think you direct that question to me because I talked about the treaty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it should be more directed to my colleagues who use the treaty because they are the ones uh, who do the daily work. Um, from my perspective, um, it is very helpful for the exchange of material amongst the CG centers for sure because they they base uh, exchange uh, on those rules. Um, uh, when it comes to material which is in national gene banks, of course, it is the question how the contracting parties national authorities uh, really make use of the possibilities in the treaty. Um, I think we in Germany make, uh, make all the material under the treaty available. We use it quite a lot even for internal exchange. I think it holds for Europe as well. So it depends on, on the contracting parties um, how much they do. And I think one important aspect is, as you just mentioned, the GLIS, the Global Information System, which is built up by the treaty. And that, I think, is in the crop trust together. So that is something which is uh, very important, I would say, for future use. Oh, lots of um, no, interaction think, yeah. on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. I think you on a very important uh, you know, topic because currently we have a system that works well. Mm -hmm. the, the gene bank platform, the crop trust, uh, those gene banks, and the treaty that regulates how some of those process issues uh, should, should happen. So I think this is really a good example that we should build on. And, and, and use more effective. My personal view, and I'm not expert on breeding in any sort, uh, in any way, uh, that we have not yet discovered the limits of what we can do. Okay. And I think there is still enormous potential. And of course, that requires additional investments. But I think this is something yet to be exploited. Thank okay. you. And Charlotte, you wanted to also? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, I mean, we've had direct experience of the treaty working. And um, I think there's been a, a decade where um, materials were no longer moving. Um, but if, if we launched a project here at the Crop Trust uh, to, to support national gene banks uh, to regenerate their materials and put them in safety duplication, and we worked with some 88 national partners who were very ready to sign up to the, the standard material transfer agreement and work within the conditions of the treaty. So it worked very much as a safe and understood mechanism that allowed countries that hadn't been material, uh, hadn't been exchanging material, and and, and institutes that have been uh, working together as well, it gave them the vehicle to, to, to move forward and to, to exchange in a way that hadn't been seen for some 10 years. And I think that will continue to improve as people do see the benefits. Yeah. I mean, I, I, just to say, I mean, I think when we started with the CCAS program, the, the treaty was always seen as kind of one of the critical enabling policies for adaptation. Because if you think about a, a world two, three, or four degrees warmer, for a country to find the materials that it needs to adapt to that, it, the higher you go, when you go to four degrees, those materials aren't in that country. So climate change is increasing this interdependency. So for Tanzania to adapt, it needs to be looking at other countries' materials. Mm -hmm. But likewise, that other country needs to be looking somewhere else. And yeah. So 
So it's 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 a case of everybody benefiting from 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 sharing because everybody is in sure. the same boat in terms of the, the adaptation challenge. Yeah, and that's not anecdotal, is it? I mean, we do have studies that quantify that yeah. the increase in interdependence. Yeah, and uh, Hannes, yes, you. It's, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Thank, thank you. Uh, I'm actually. Uh, just a personal view. Uh, I'm quite scared after all these presentations, and especially the presentation from Ali Abu Sabah. Uh, I mean, we're right next to the building where they're dig discussing reaching the two degree target, but as you pointed out, you know, a four degree warmer world could be a possibility, and it has grave implications. And as you showed, you know, that, that needs sort of transformational change, changes from agriculture, you know, some really deep structural changes. and. To me, some of these uh, efforts seem to be rather incremental. I mean, Andy, you pointed out breeding four, three, four degrees. Uh, but I'm just personally scared and wondering, you know, can we achieve transformational change that is necessary to meet food security, as you had in your slide, Andy, as well? So just trying to think, what, what is the reality? Is there a tipping point? Okay. What does transformational change look like? Well, I think maybe first, I would not be uh, alarmed or scared. I would actually be, be confident that we are starting now to look at the solutions. I think it's all about statistics. I think what you have seen in the presentation is 40% chance of something occurring by the end of the century. 40%, maybe around 4 degrees, maybe even 10% could take us to 5. That's important for us to see from a science perspective. You have to recognize we're not here sitting in the negotiations room where there are certain boundaries that you know could influence how decisions are being made. Here we're looking purely from a science perspective, and science should not be constrained. I think we should have the liberty in science to look at ch possibilities, chances, and then for us to really work on what could be the potential solutions. Whether you use a solution or not is a different matter. But I think there is a generally a clear evidence that the world is warming up. The limits is an, a, a scientific exercise or a practical exercise. We're yet to see all, all of those things. What we're doing here is we're using the options that are offered by those gene banks, the research programs of collectively of the CGIR centers to look at what could be the options for those things. If it happens, then the options will be there. You spoke about the alternative. I think we've seen some instances where people today can no longer do farming. They moved into solar energy, the existing farms, but they did not have to migrate. There was no forced migration, simply because they had an alternative for them to continue the livelihood. And when you look at the socioeconomic components of most of the programs we need, that, that we, we, we undertake research on, you have this integration that should also not rule out this possibility and provide those alternative options in case they have them. I'm sure there might be many other options, but I'm just citing you one example. And uh, maybe if I can just add, I mean, if you let, let's be optimistic and say we agree on a two degree target and achieve it, right? But two degrees, let's say, would have what forty years or so to to reach that two degree increase. And uh, in forty years with breeding, if you look at the kind of the the current rate of of, of gain in terms of uh, heat uh, tolerance and, and 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 some of the issues of drought tolerance, we've done analysis on maize in Africa. And it's and it's show, it's barely keeping up with with the rate of change of climate. Um, so I mean, I I personally think it's something where there's been very little attention in the adaptation community at the importance of investment in 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 breeding. Um, but I think it's it's one of your very critical tools in terms of adapting, having having those technologies. So it does need greater investment. I think it needs more a higher profile kind of in for, from a climate finance standpoint. This is. This is a very, very uh, solid kind of technology to future-proof uh, against the two-degree world. <coughs> and even in a, an a, even in a two-degree world, right? There could be places with four degrees uh, yes. incre increases. And why, why throw them, them under the bus? And two degrees in agriculture is huge, yeah. right? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes, Massa. Okay. First of all, uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Margaret for the introduction and uh, for uh, panel speakers. And uh, all of you made a, a, a point uh, very clear that uh, we are facing with a major challenge. And uh, that uh, I uh, congratulate all uh, speakers. But the one thing that I felt a bit uh, missing uh, is uh, uh, nutritional uh, concern. 
uh, when you talk about uh, food security, it's almost equal to uh, calorie. And the food is not just calorie. Um, and uh, just roll over uh, gene banks and uh, breeding. Uh, it's not only for uh, more uh, food uh, calorie production, uh, in spite of uh, increased uh, uh, temperature, but provide uh, uh, better uh, nutrition uh, for our current and uh, future uh, generation. And by having a not just a uh, genetic diversity, uh, intraspecific uh, diversity, but uh, taking advantage of uh, interspecific diversity, uh, we can uh, address many problems. And uh, as uh, uh, Sharp mentioned, that uh, if um, uh, beans, common beans, fazulas, uh, does not work, <laughs> we may switch to uh, bigna, uh, cowpea. So, uh, we look, need to look at a much wider scale of, um, of uh, how we deploy uh, short-term and long-term uh, biodiversity uh, to make uh, our uh, diet healthier and the uh, ecosystem itself uh, healthier. And perhaps the uh, uh, theme of today's uh, meeting <coughs> is uh, uh, breeding. Uh, and, uh, looking into uh, 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 future uh, scenario. But I feel that uh, uh, we, we should recognize, even now, uh, we have a, a major problem. Yeah. Uh, even uh, before looking at the scary uh, future of uh, 2010. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, then what we can do uh, now, and also looking into uh, future, and not only f uh, food calorie, but uh, uh, diet, uh, nutrition. Absolutely. And there you can see uh, a value of uh, your uh, uh, crops, like a legume, a fava bean, a lentil, and so on. Uh, fair, currently, 60% of our food calorie comes from uh, only three e e grains. Yes. So just I, I like to make a comment that the uh, uh, value of uh, uh, gene banks and uh, breeding is not just uh, uh, food production Absolutely. in terms of calorie. Can Thank we you. allow uh, Dr. Yeah. Michael Baum, uh, director of the crop improvement? I mean, because that's really at the heart. Nutrition is at the heart of what we do in terms sure, of crop. Sure, we can do that. Um, you would like to answer that? So the question was, um, uh, you know, are, are breeders focusing too much just on yield? Definitely not, uh, <coughs> because you know, uh, for instance, in the in the CG between the centers, there's a big program on uh, on nutrition, nutritional security. For instance, uh, <coughs> um, uh, Mr. Ali Abu Sabah, he mentioned the example of uh, targeting uh, legume species for for South Asia. Uh, most of our <coughs> uh, legume species, especially lentils and chickpeas, are uh, subjected to a program for increased iron and uh, breeding. And uh, <coughs> so there were varieties that we deploy there that uh, with a short duration to fit in the rice uh, uh, fellow rotation also have an increased concentration on iron and zinc and um, um, very important component f um, for uh, South Asia to improve uh, nutritional s uh, security. But across uh, the CG there are also other programs looking at other n nutritional factors. So it's not only iron and zinc, it's uh, it's uh, um, short uh, cookability and a lot, lots of uh, different traits that, uh, that are looked at and of course uh, um, that uh, maybe are not the focus of, uh, of uh, uh, um, these uh, presentations, but it is, uh, it is being considered and being tak taken care of. Okay. Did anything of, yeah. There's something of emerging kind of concern is also there's, there's grown evidence that with increased CO2 levels in the air, <laughs> nutritional quality of crops is also going down. So that this is kind of almost there's, there's so little known about this one, um, but uh, something that definitely needs a bit more attention. Did anybody want to? Yeah. All right. Yes. Um, I have two uh, quick questions. Uh, the first one, is, they're both sort of in, 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 on the question of urgency. Um, and the first one is um, we've just had a treaty governing body meeting a, a couple of weeks ago in Kigali uh, in Rwanda. And I was wondering to what extent the urgency of climate change features in those discussions. And 
And what happened? Does that make the treaty community come together and, and sort of more uh, lead to more concerted action than we've seen in the past? That's my first question. The second question was, um, in, for sort of major shifts, we really need more investment, I think, as Annie had mentioned, in breeding programs. But what we see around the world is a, a concerted disinvestment in public breeding, especially. And there's this notion out there that the private sector will just pick it up, which I think is, is safe to say is not happening because the private sector works on very different incentives. Um, so I was wondering whether the panel could comment on both those questions. All right, Thomas, you were, you were in Kigali and you were party to the, some, to the negotiations, of course. Would you like to kind of give a brief summary of what happened and uh, gauge the atmosphere of the meeting? Yes, of course. Um, I mean, you were there as well, so... <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, but I was in privy to all, these, to all I guess. the discussions behind closed doors. Oh, I guess that's where you are smiling. Um, there's, I think there's, there's still this, this uh, two diverging views which you have um, between, let's say, CBD people and, and treaty people, whereas the, the, I would say, more bilateral thinking people put more emphasis on this um, benefit sharing um, aspect of the whole um, complex whereas others um, put more on the on the um, on the access uh, side um, and I mean we have to be fair um, experience from from the last uh, what we have 10 years now um, with no benefit sharing from from commercial uh, benefits of course is not uh, really a sign that this system is functioning there are good explanations for that. Uh, you have only benefit sharing, commercial benefit sharing, if you have protected varieties. Um, um, so um, mostly patent protected, and so far the, the country using mostly patents, like the US, um, were not on board, so they entered only now. So all the varieties we develop here with treaty material are without benefit sharing, without monetary benefit sharing to the benefit sharing fund, to be exact. Um, so there is some kind of, of discontent in, in, in parts of the world saying, okay, we, we gave access and now we don't get enough back. I showed these 20 millions which, which have been put into the benefit sharing fund, which have been spread around the world, but this is still something which um, is not really satisfactory to, to all contracting parties, I would say. So this was a critical point now because we are in the negotiations for four years now to um, enhance the, function, the functioning of this system and um, this governing body was, from my perspective, quite disappointing, to be honest, because it was, we didn't really move uh, forward. We, we uh, agreed to, to go on negotiating. Um, so let's see what, what, what happens uh, in the next two years. Um, Okay, the question is, did the, did the contracting parties feel the urgency? I would say yes, they feel, but um, they have different approaches uh, to deal with that. Some say, okay, we have to speed up uh, access, we have to facilitate that access to exchange more material. And others say, yeah, fair enough, but then we need better benefit sharing. And that's uh, the discussion we are still in. And what about, uh, who would like to say something about the role of the private sector? In all this, I think for somebody in one of the presentations, for example, there was something about the um, uh, uh, drought-resistant maize for Africa. That's a public-private partnership. There are others in breeding. Would somebody like to say something about the, the, the role of private sector in some of these um, in, in the breeding advantage? And Victor. Oh, Victor would like to say that. <laughs> a bit of experience on the. Senate side, so you've got some positive experiences where private sector becomes joins a club, puts a little bit of money in, and they do research together, or they have early access to research. That works. When it comes to the realities with the treaty, you've got both, for example, a company with B. Um, they just talk to Simit to offer certain traits on an SMTA basis. And then you have the exact opposite on another company, starts with M, and they would never dream of using SMTA. Yeah. Overall, I would say it's not been helpful in terms of accessing genetic material for public sector need. That will be our assessment right now. And I'm sure that assessment is shared by Yuri, my guess, Seat as well. Yeah? So what, what would need to change, do you think? 
Oh, excuse me, the people that are here on the panel. I was waiting for a little bit of transformational suggestions here. Um, and I mean, there's a big elephant in the room that we've not talked about, and that is that we've got all the gene banks and the data, we've got the breeders, and in most cases they're not connected, and we've not done a good enough job on the score, and I was hoping for some transformational ideas here, um, and that's our job here, International Agricultural Research. That's what we should be focusing on, making a difference. Let's see if we can get yeah. some transformational ideas about linking gene banks and farmers. Who's got? I, I who's don't have transformational idea per se, but I mean, coming from outside the system, I see a lot of opportunities that has not been tapped yet about potential public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. And I think the stumbling block so far continues to be the whole issue about perceptions and regulation. So I think there is a need to urgently invest in new forms of partnerships that brings greater benefits to the CGIR and possibly Jim Banks, the Crop Trust and others that would allow us a, sh a reasonable share of the benefits so that you are able to continue to invest in upstream and public research. I think public, purely public good uh, service to continue the way it was many years ago when public funding was at adequate level is not justified anymore. And if the system is expected to continue to do its core duties, it is absolutely important we look at new ways of partnering with the private sector in a manner that brings in greater benefit to the system. And I mean, I, I, I just add that I think, I think we need to make a good business case of why crop improvement is actually very, very attractive to climate finance. Um, the, the, the challenge is that in three years, in four years, you're not going to have necessarily a huge result. But in, uh, you know, in 20 years, the, 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 the cost benefit of investing in, in breeding is going to be absolutely phenomenally big in terms of climate adaptation. So if we can make that argument a lot better and, and develop those business cases, I think then you know, that's, that's connecting these two worlds that are not necessarily talking. And it's the same happens in the policy side of things. The treaty is probably the best adaptation policy out there that you know, in COP23, it's hardly ever talked about. And so the, it's really about connecting these two. And so I think we as a community need to, need to get better at that. Of course, we also need to uh, to uh, highlight that uh, the private sector is uh, really not interested in a lot of our uh, self-pollinating crops. I mean, the uh, private sector might be interested in maize and in uh, <coughs> and in soya, but uh, but in lot of in lot of uh, uh, crops like wheat and wheat and rice and uh, uh, legumes. Um, so far, they are not investing because they don't see the p the poss possibility and the opportunity to make money. So that's why um, that's also not going to change in uh, 10 years or 20 years' time with or without uh, um, climate change. So uh, um, unless we have rough but uh, we don't not, not, necess not necessarily want to go that road to make it more complicated than it is. So for you know for for the crops, our crops, uh, rice and wheat and and others that are self-pollinating crops. We will rely, we'll continue to rely in future on public uh, 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 funding unless we, we invent other mos models that make it uh, attractive for the pri private sector to, to invest. Now, um, <coughs> where the private sector uh, engaged into uh, cross-pollinating crops like maize, yes, with the current uh, legislation that we have, there are difficulties because uh, um, for, for many, many years to, to come with an SMTA. Um, 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 there are, they are problems with, uh, with uh, pat patenting and uh, 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 ownerships. And uh, so that's why uh, even for, for those crops, the private sector is reluctant to, uh, to engage into the public-private uh, partnerships. So unless, <coughs> um, you know, I'm also not an expert in in the legislation, but uh, um, you know, if you if you want to make it more amenable for investment by the private sector, so we need to look into uh, the legislation that is available to to, to encourage investment by the private sector. Okay, we we'll have to draw this to a close. But I think there was one final, perhaps, question. Oh no, there's another. I think no, no. Oh, three questions. Yeah. Okay, all right. You don't want a fourth one? Okay. Please. So a question for the panel. Um, we have Harvest Plus that has been streamed uh, all the 
a biofortification in certain crops. Are there any efforts for having like a harvest plus plus for trades for climate change, for breeding um, like drought resistance, uh, heat resistance, etc.? So a, 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 a dedicated <laughs> Let's do <it>. sea cap. <laughs> um, who would like to tackle that? Well, I see a hand there. I, I know I'm not aware of any at the moment, but I'm sure Michael may share uh, some more insights. Yes, uh, at least in, uh, in principle. So there's a consortium called Hedwig, Heat and Drought, uh, <coughs> uh, to deal with issues uh, as heat and drought. So there was, there was a group of, I don't know, 150 scientists meeting in Frankfurt uh, two years ago to discuss principle of such a consortium, specifically looking, looking into heat and drought. And uh, um, at the, so that is headed by a number of people like uh, Peter Langridge from <coughs> Australia, Matthew Reynolds from CIMIT. Um, um, and I think at the moment it's in the stage of uh, looking for donors to uh, get initial funding. And uh, so uh, similarly, like Harvest Plus, should be a program that runs for five years or 10 years in order to uh, that, uh <coughs> that uh, but basically, all the the physiologists, um, breeders for main crops are involved in this I initiative, and uh, at the moment we're looking for funders to to invest in in such a um, program that again is in the public uh, uh, public hand. Okay. And let's give the last question to to Margaret here. I have some more comment, but yep. I wonder always when we discuss the private sector in the context of breeding, being a beneficiary of public breeding, privatizing whatever they use out of the public breeding for private use, uh, whether we lead that discussion at the right level. And my question to the panel at large would be, um, I think what we discuss today here, I'm sure the private sector discusses all the time too. I mean, if we sit here and say four of the biggest crops that are being grown today are potentially at risk in many parts of the world, what is perhaps called an orphan crop today may not be an orphan crop tomorrow. And I would be surprised if this is not something the private sector eagerly looks to because they don't want to be out of business in 15 years because they've bet on potentially a crop that's not going to bring the returns it has brought in the past. So taking this more at the strategic level rather than the legislative level or the treaty and regular level would of course shift the dialogue also to different people. But I wonder whether this is something the group has ever thought about, um, even if it's just over lunch in the cafeteria, how to get out of this idea and what kind of ideas may have emerged from it. So moving, moving to other crops, uh, uh, so the future belongs to sorghum and millets in, uh, and barley. In the, and, bar and barley, Please. yeah. Can't grow wheat anymore, you go there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Would li anybody like to have one final word on that? Uh, I, I can. As long as it's not Michael, because he's spoken quite a lot on I this. can start. I yeah. can start. I think these are the kind of things you need to elevate the level of advocacy at a different level. I think we need to leverage. Uh, things such as the G20 conversations, some of the major multilateral banks coming together and discussing the future of food security in the world, leveraging uh, organizations like FAO, IFAD, because the dialogue has to go few steps higher, not just one step higher. It has to go few steps higher. And one good thing, I think, collectively at the CJR, you know, the recent meeting, we've, for instance, the, agreed on and uh, to have an ambassador for resource mobilization, ambassador for the system, someone who can knock on the doors of ambassador, of presidents of countries and you know foreign ministers is no longer about the level of you know DGs or you know uh, you know their staff accessing the usual channels for funding. Someone like Anwizi, former uh, uh, president of IFAD. So the level of conversation for this transformation to happen has to really go to higher levels. To higher levels. Now, of course, these are still things that are yet uh, to be seen in, in, in action and in practice. And we have to bring this to a close, but uh, let me say in closing that we have an opportunity to take it to a higher level at the final of these uh, 
uh, the series of um, uh, side events uh, on the agricultural advantage. We've talked about gender, policy, agronomy, uh, low emissions, business, and breeding. And the final uh, wrap-up session is uh, tomorrow at 1 p.m., 1 to 5 p.m., at the German Development Institute, uh, where we hope to take it to a higher, high level, higher level and to wrap it up, wrap up and this discussion on, on making the case for agriculture uh, action uh, in, on climate change. Thank you very much, both to uh, the audience here and online, and see you tomorrow. Bye.